Why, hello, my fine feathered friends. How's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. The show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, uh, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we theorycraft about that character uh, that we've created. We do some number crunching, we get a little geeky, and basically um, we just uh, you know, try to create a character that's both really fun to play, but also very powerful uh, in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters in D&D almost as much, as playing the actual game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and we're super happy to have you. So thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before I get started, just a quick reminder. Um, if you uh, enjoy the channel and the content that I put out and are looking for a way to um, support me and us, uh, please consider joining as a member. There should be a little button uh, down in the corner there that lets you do that. Um, it's only a dollar or two a month. I really only have one perk of any kind of significance right now, and it's a small one at that. It's just a like a write-up cheat sheet uh, that I put out to um, the community of $2 a month sponsors anyway. Uh, silver status people. I don't even have gold status. That's how uh, lowly we are. But anyway, it does a lot to support me and us and uh, help me put out more and better content. So thank you for your consideration, and thanks uh, for those who are members, and thanks f to you who are watching who don't want to or don't feel you've got the need, the means um, to support us in that way. That's okay. I appreciate having you, and if you just like the video and um, watch it, then that's great for us as well. So thank you. Anyway, um, it's been a minute since I've done a full tank build. Last month, uh, in the Wolf and Coyote team-up build that I did, here we go, card number one, um, the, the Wolf Totem Barbarian was tanky and tried to encourage enemies to attack them, but they weren't really built for survivability in a way that I think um, most of us think of when, when we think of what it means to be like a tank or a defender or a protector archetype in D&D and other role-playing games for that matter. In fact, the last pure tank build that I did was the rogue tank. Um, there we go. Uh, check that out if you haven't seen it, uh, which was several months ago. So I think it's time to do another one. Way back when I did my mounted battlesmith build, we are going to burn through our cards very quickly this week, um, I said that one day I wanted to do a real like Rider of Rohan mounted build, right? And I've put that off for long enough, I think. So today is the day that we do that. But here is an important note before I jump in. There's not really a lot about this build that, that requires you to be on a mount. If mounted combat doesn't really appeal to you all that much, or if you think it's too finicky or whatever, you could still play this build with really only a couple of tweaks and I think still be a very fantastic tank. I wanted to create a tank on a warhorse, so that's how I'm going to talk about this character. And then of course, before we do that, um, I need to spend some time talking about tanks and about mounted combat in particular. So. First up, mounted combat. Mounted combat in D&D is uh, complicated, to say the least. There are a lot of things in the rules that, in my opinion, are left a little vague or open to, open to interpretation um, by your DM. If you're interested in a deep dive into the questions and potential problems that mounted combat can bring up at your table, um, check out the sliding into my DMs episode we did on that a while uh, a while back where we try to address all of those questions. Uh, for me, the number one biggest concern that I have about mounted combat for this build in particular is this. I really want my mounted tank to be big and powerful. Riding a war horse or maybe even an elk or something like that into combat, um, fighting on like a big open bat battlefield, making heroic cavalry-like charges, etc. Unfortunately, a lot of Dungeons & Dragons isn't played on big open battlefields, but um, in, well, dungeons, right? Uh, or often buildings, etc., right? Or in other cramped spaces uh, and, and tight quarters. So 
War horses and elks are large creatures. It's going to be tough to maneuver your large mount inside a cramped space, and there are solutions for that, of course, but just keep in mind, if, if you're considering playing a character that spends most of their time, ideally, on a large mount, it might work best in a campaign that is played mostly like outdoors, right? Otherwise, you might have to temper your expectations for how you build this character and or how often you get to play them like in the way that you envision. Alternatively, of course, if you'd like to, you could play a small sized character and ride a medium sized mount or as many people like to request of me um, on the shoulders of another player, a small sized character on the shoulders or piggybacking on a medium sized player, uh, which technically could probably work, but I don't know if I'll ever do that, to be honest with you. I just, I think it's so cheesy, but that's just my opinion and I might eat my words um, later. So, you know, don't hold me to that. But regardless, it would work for this build for the most part as well. I am not going to build this character that way as a small character. My hope is that we will mostly get to play outdoors or otherwise in open roomy spaces. Your DM could ideally make adjustments if you were to talk this over with them and let them know kind of what you were wanting to do. You could always make the dungeon and the cave, you know, a little bit bigger in dimensions. If, if that's not going to work and you still want to be mounted, you could create a small creature, ride a medium sized mount, and otherwise follow the build for the most part. As for tanks, without spending too much time rehashing uh, preambles from previous tank builds, I'll just quickly say this. To be a good tank, in Dungeons and Dragons, you can't just be hard to kill, right? You have to also be able to encourage enemies to attack you, I think. Something that doesn't necessarily come very easily in D&D. And I think also otherwise find ways to reduce damage done to your allies and protect them, right? So while we will be focusing on survivability when we crunch the numbers, a lot of the decisions that we make will be in the name of directing damage our way and reducing damage dealt to our allies, even if it means taking some of that damage yourself, right? And with that role of the tank in mind, in the end, I think this character that we're about to jump into here might be the best tank that I've done so far, insofar as they have great survivability, maybe not the best of, of you know, when compared to other tank builds, but they're probably better than any other build that I've done yet, I think, in protecting their allies. Um, so, without any further ado, I present episode 51, The Knight in Shining Armor, which I will dedicate to my friend Tori, uh, whose character, Eve, from our Tales of Anaria actual play sessions, and there we go, I'm at my fifth card already in the preamble. Check it out here if you're interested in watching us play D&D. Her character, Eve, uh, served as inspiration for this character. Actually, I do have one ado. And it is, of course, to mention uh, this week's sponsor for the video, which is, um, as last time, the uh, Druid's Secrets of the Primal Circle, brought to us by Homebrewed Games. Um, I've talked about this a couple of times already. You guys know how I feel. I think it's a fantastic book. Um, a little compendium for 5th edition, and if you are into druids, you guys have got to check this out. Their Kickstarter is live, it launched about a week ago, and so I'm going to make sure to put a link in the video description for you to click on and follow it and uh, and back these guys because they're fantastic. Um, Matt and Seamus, I've met them both, and uh, they're smart and fun and funny, and they've created just a fantastic compendium here. If you are interested in druids, in D and D, you really owe it to yourself to check this out. Um, again, there's a whole new class, uh, the Dire Druid, which is awesome, and I love. There's there are a lot of new subclasses, new Druid circles to check out, new spells, new magic items, new beasts and bestiary, and tons and tons of like lore and background and backstory for the Druid. And that's actually the thing that I wanted to highlight a little bit today. It gives us info on the origins of the druid. It talks about um, the origins of the wild shape ability. It talks about how to use um, druidic in your games a lot more effectively and also like give you better reasons and make it a little more powerful to have druidic. There are druidic councils, which is really cool. But the thing that I wanted to focus on 
is um, the aversion to metal. This has come up in a lot of my builds, actually, and even as recently as um, the Twilight Cleric Circle of the Stars uh, druid that I did just a couple of weeks ago, the healer, full-time healer build. Um, you know, I, I sometimes forget, frankly, that according to, you know, official D&D uh, lore, druids have this aversion to metal, and we're told they will not wear metal armor or use metal weapons, but we're not really given a lot of reasons as to why that's the case. And and even, like, Jeremy Crawford himself has kind of said, eh, I mean, they'll explode, ha ha ha. They're, they're not actually going to explode. This is kind of a choice, and you can do it or not, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just a little bit nebulous and a little bit... Uh, it's always been a little bit of a head-scratcher to me. And, you know, these guys give you, like, pages on the curse of blood and iron and this whole history, the queen's curse, the vow of blood and iron. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but shadowy vows and promises, the disturbance caused my metal, and all these reasons as to why druids have this aversion and some specifics as to what actually will happen to you as a druid if you choose to wear metal armor or use metal weapons. There are some actual like in-game penalties, but at the same time, they don't just kind of leave you high and dry, and they give you lots of um, druid-friendly weapons and armor, things like ironwood, and ways to either magically craft them or find them in-game, some things that, that function similarly or even sometimes more powerfully than metal would. So you don't have to feel like, you know, you want to play this druid, but you have to kind of suffer this penalty because you have this aversion to metal, right? And so, I don't know, I just really like it. I feel like it fills out that question and that space of, you know, the druid's aversion to metal, not just from a story perspective, but also from a mechanics perspective, and give you some great alternatives uh, to be able to use and not feel like you're going to be weaker just because of this role play the supposed aversion that you have that your DM may or may not, you know, force upon you in game or something like that. So anyway, one of the things that I love about it, again, Check it out. Back them on their Kickstarter. Um, it's a fantastic book, and uh, and I hope you guys will enjoy it as much as I have. Okay, back to the build. All right, at level one, for our class, we are going to start as a fighter. Um, and for our race, I'm going to recommend the Mark of the Sentinel human. First time I've used that uh, race, actually. Assuming you can play with the Eberron book. I love this race for this character. If you can't use Eberron, I would probably go Variant Human uh, for the free feet or Custom Lineage, uh, especially if you wanted to be small, because Custom Lineage gets the free feet and can be medium or small size. Um, if you already get a free feat at your table or are simply looking for something else to play, um, other considerations I think would be uh, either Seder or Yuan T Pure Blood for the magic resistance would be fantastic. Um, a Warforge for the plus one to armor class, um, or even just like a Hill Dwarf for the extra hit points. But Mark of Sentinel humans um, are, are perfect for this build, I think. Um, not only are they sort of lore-wise kind of inherently tanky and protectory, but they get some fantastic features uh, and abilities that, that come along with them. Sentinel's Intuition, which gives them an extra d4 on any insight or perception check, which is going to be super handy. They get the vigilant a, a Vigilant Guardian feature, which tells us that when a creature you can see within five feet of you is hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction. We're going to have a lot of uses for our reaction, but you could use your reaction to swap places with that creature, and you are hit by the attack instead. You can only do this once per day, but that's really cool. You also get the Guardian's Shield feature, which allows us to cast the Shield spell once per day. And that's fantastic, right? As a reaction, it lets you increase your armor class by five for an entire round if you get hit um, by an attack. And that's really going to improve our tankiness and survivability. I'll talk more about that when we start crunching the numbers. Anyway, you also get some additional spells that you get to add uh, to your spell list later on when we get a spell casting ability. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of great, cool, fun, uh, flavorful, protective features with this race, and so I really like it. As for our abilities, I'm going to assume, as always, that we are doing the point by 
uh, method and using Tasha's that allows us to put our racial bonuses where we want. So I would say start with a 14 strength, take your plus two there, so you've got a 16, a 15 constitution, your plus one there, so you've got 16 constitution as well. Um, we're gonna want a 14 charisma and then a 12 dexterity. As for your equipment, Fairly standard stuff, uh, chainmail armor, your favorite D8 weapon, like a longsword or a warhammer or something, um, and a shield. Uh, as for a mount, you know, something you're going to want to talk with your DM about. Can you start your character at level 1 with a mount? A warhorse costs 400 gold. No level 1 character could actually afford that. But it, it's such an integral part to your character, right, that you might be able to convince your dungeon master that you should be able to start with a mount. Um, maybe you inherited it or something like that. I don't know. And, and maybe it's not a war horse, right? Maybe it's just a draft horse at the beginning. Those, those are only 50 gold. That's not a huge ask. If you're small, a mastiff, uh, you know, which is a medium-sized mount potentially, is only 25 gold. You could probably afford that even if you took the gold buy option. But anyway, talk that over with your DM. If you can't start off with a mount, then just try to save your money and get one as soon as possible. As for what else we get, at fighter level one, we get uh, the second wind feature, which again is a, you know, as a bonus action, one, or once per short rest, you can uh, heal yourself for 1d10 plus your fighter level. Um, that's really nice for early levels, especially to keep yourself alive. And then we do get a fighting style. I would recommend taking the interception fighting style. It's my favorite fighting style for like defense and protection as a reaction. Uh, if there's an ally within five feet of you that gets hit by an attack, you can sort of intercede with your weapon or your shield and reduce the damage that they take by 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus. And yeah, that's just a, a fantastic tanky feature that's going to let you help uh, keep your allies safe. And that's what we're here for. At level two, um, we get Action Surge. Uh, we're not building this character with a focus on their damage, but of course, that's not to say that you and your party won't still benefit from you doing more damage, right? So Action Surge, uh, once per short rest, you can get an additional action on your turn, right? And you can use that action. It's a full action. Uh, you don't get an you don't get an additional bonus action, but if you're making an attack as an action, you can action surge and make another attack. Or later on, when we get extra attack, you can make two attacks and then action surge and take two more attacks, right? So, very strong ability. We use it often. And for us, in fact, you know, even though we're not focused on damage, more attacks will actually even add to our ability to sort of be a better tank and direct damage our way because. Of course, at level three, fighters get their martial archetype, their subclass, and we are, uh, surprising no one, going with the cavalier archetype. So here's what we read about the cavalier. The archetypal cavalier excels at mounted combat, usually born among the nobility and raised at court. A cavalier is equally at home leading a cavalry charge or exchanging repartee at a state dinner. Cavaliers also learn how to guard those in their charge from harm, often serving as the protectors of their superiors and of the weak. Compelled to right wrongs or earn prestige, many of these fighters leave their lives of comfort to embark on glorious adventure. I think if you're going for a knight in shining armor type character, especially one who's going to try and be a mounted tank, you almost have to go cavalier. It's so perfect uh, flavor-wise, right? So. You're chivalrous, you're an expert horseman or horsewoman, and you get some fantastic ways to encourage enemies to attack you and protect your allies. So first up, as a cavalier, we get uh, born to saddle, and um, that gives us advantage on saving throws to avoid falling off your mount. Normally we're told that if you're mounted uh, and an effect moves your mount against its will, like a shove or a spell, etc., you have to make a dexterity 10 saving throw or you fall off. If you fall off, you're supposed to be knocked prone, but cavaliers, because of this feature, um, can land on their feet, even if they do fall off, uh, so long as they fall no more, no more than 10 feet. Um, so I suppose it won't work if you are riding like an elephant or a flying mount which we might be able to do later. Also, mounting or dismounting normally costs half your movement, 
uh, but for us it's only five feet. So a lot of nice sort of quality of life improvements here that might not necessarily affect our numbers so much, but will make using a mount a lot easier. More importantly, we get the unwavering mark feature, which is really our most powerful ability as a cavalier, I think. So we're told that when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, uh, you can mark them until the end of your next turn. While that creature is within five feet of you, and that's important, um, a marked creature has disadvantage against any creature other than you when they're making attacks. That's about as good as like taunting gets in D&D. Taunting, you know, sort of forcing, or at least encouraging in this case, an enemy to attack you instead of somebody else. Now, here, the great thing about it is that no, you can't force them to attack you, but even if they decide to go for your ally, they're going to have disadvantage and therefore will on average hit less often and therefore do less damage uh, you know, over time to your allies. So you're really doing a great job with this ability of offering them some protection um, and ideally encouraging you know, the enemy to attack you instead. What's more, if they do damage to anyone other than you and they're marked, it could even be via like an area of effect spell or something, even to an ally across the battlefield. They don't have to be, uh, ne the, the ally doesn't have to be next to you. On your next turn, you can make like an extra attack as a bonus action against that enemy that's marked that did damage to somebody else. And you get to do a little extra bonus damage uh, if you hit equal to half your fighter level. Pretty nice. You can only do that sort of extra bonus action attack uh, strength modifier times per day. So for us, that's three. But again, a nice way to do a little extra damage if and when you know your marked enemy does damage to one of your friends. Let me take a moment here and mention something else too. A lot of us, I think, when you know when we think about uh, a mounted knight archetype, probably envision them charging into battle with a lance as a weapon. I was tempted to use a lance for both uh, like flavor and the extra damage that it does. It's a D12 weapon as opposed to a D8, and it has reach, right? So you can make attacks from 10 feet away. The problem with the lance, however, is that we get disadvantage on enemies we attack with it that are within five feet of us. I could have forgone that limitation if it weren't for the fact that with unwavering mark, our enemy has to be within five feet of us for us to impose that disadvantage when, when they attack someone other than us, right? So that's a little clunky here. I suppose we could, you know, like attack them from 10 feet with our lance and then move up next to them and end our turn, right? But if on our next turn that enemy is still alive, then we would have to like take an opportunity attack to back up and hit him with our lance, you know, if we don't want to have disadvantage on the attack. It got a little clunky. Feel free to do that if you want, or even like maybe you make your initial charge with the lance and then throw it down and pull out your long sword on subsequent turns or something like that. But anyway, that's why I haven't talked about the lance up until now. Okay, at level four, we get our first ability score increase our feet. And here is an important question that we need to answer for this character. How important is the mounted combatant feat? If you're not playing this character as a mounted character, then of course there's no reason to take it. But otherwise, on the one hand, it almost feels like sacrilege to me, anyway, uh, to play a tank focused on mounted combat and not take this feat. On the other, it might not actually do a lot for our survivability and you know ability to effectively tank. I think it will largely depend on how you're playing the game, how the game is going at your table, how your dungeon master, you know, what kind of adventure your dungeon master is running. First up, the feat gives us advantage on melee attack rolls against any creature smaller than your mount. If you're small, if you're a small creature riding on a medium-sized mount, this isn't going to do very much for you, right? I mean, a lot of enemies in the game are, are medium sized. So if you're on a large mount, that's great. And you're going to have advantage a lot of the time, but otherwise you're probably not, right? And again, you know, even though we aren't building this character for damage, landing our attacks is going to seriously increase our ability to keep our allies safe as a cavalier. So I think it's pretty important. It really benefits us and our party, frankly, quite a bit for us to have advantage on those attacks. Another nice benefit to the mounted combatant uh, feat, you can force any attack made 
against your mount to attack you instead. Crafty DM, uh, fine, a crafty enemy, because the DM is not your enemy, right? Might try to cut your legs out from under you, right? By attacking your mount. So if your enemy, if your, if your DM and or the enemies that they control are often targeting your mount, this is going to be a fairly necessary feat, I think. But otherwise, it, you know, again, not as important. Finally, your mount essentially gets like the rogue evasion feature when you take this feat. Uh, if they have to make a dexterity saving throw to take half damage, then they take no damage if they succeed and only half damage if they fail. All fantastic features, uh, but none of which I have any real idea how useful they'll be in your campaign, right? That said, since I'm assuming that we're playing this character in a campaign that was built for an awesome large mount mounted combat experience, I think I have to take this feat here. Uh, even though taking a bump to our constitution or even the tough feat would do more to increase our survivability. If it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to take this feat, whether because you're a small creature on a medium mount or because of how your DM is playing things or because you're not even playing this character as a mounted character, you know, just I would probably bump con, uh, you know, constitution or even take the tough feat here to get more hit points, or of course, you could always bump your strength to ensure you land your attacks more often and um, do a little more damage. At level five, here's another one of those, if I were playing this character in game, I might make a different choice uh, moments, but I'm going to say that we go Paladin one here. Um, you might want to go Fighter five to get that extra attack and again, both do more damage and also be able to mark your targets more effectively and even multiple targets potentially, right? But we, we wanna go Paladin for a number of reasons. And if you wanna delay that by one level, you know, that's fine. Regardless, even though Cavalier is the subclass that is just sort of absolutely meant to be the mounted combat specialist, I think, in this game, the Paladin, in my mind, is the class that I think of when I think of a knight in shining armor. Sworn to defend the innocent and the vulnerable, dedicated to justice and righteousness, it's kind of that knight of the round table, you know, class, I think, in D&D. And so, to me, they kind of take the concept that we're going for to, to the next level. So, I really want paladin levels, even just for, like, story and flavor alone. But of course, they do get some amazing ways to protect their allies. And um, they also get access to the best mounts in the game. So I think it would be a shame to not take Paladin levels uh, for this character concept. So I'm gonna say we're going Paladin one here at level five, even though it delays extra attack and you may think I'm crazy and that's okay. We get Divine Sense as a Paladin one. That gives us some nice utility that lets you basically detect undead, fiend, and celestials within 60 feet a number of times uh, per day. And then we get the Lay on Hands feature, which basically gives you a pool of points equal to five times your Paladin level. You can use those to heal or cure disease or poison even. Uh, they refresh on a long rest and it's a pretty strong heal for us early on. Um, to help out our allies. At level six, we are a paladin level two. Um, we get another fighting style, which is great. Um, you know, we've already got a great way to protect our allies uh, with the interception fighting style. So I would suggest taking the defense fighting style here, which just bumps our armor class by one. That's always welcome to increase our survivability. We also, of course, get the Divine Smite feature. You know, we're not gonna have a ton of spell slots to burn uh, for Smite with this build. So I would probably use it somewhat sparingly, but as many people like to say in the comments of my other tank builds, uh, the best way to protect your allies is by killing your enemies, right? Because a dead enemy does zero damage. Divine Smite, you get, uh, when you hit with a weapon attack, you can burn a spell slot and add 2d8 radiant damage, plus 1d8 if they're undead or fiend, and then if you use a higher level spell slot, it's an extra 1d8 for every, you know, higher than first level spell slot you go. We also get spells here. Uh, first level spells, there's some great options. I would probably make sure to get Cure Wounds for some additional heals. 
Heroism is a nice way to protect your allies with some temporary hit points and even uh, make them immune to uh, the frightened condition for a minute if you want to use your concentration for it. But I think our concentration will probably be spent on Shield of Faith. Uh, so Shield of Faith as a bonus action and with your concentration, you can raise your armor class by two or an ally's armor class uh, by two. You know, your I guess your DM might not be playing against you how you want right and having the enemies attack you when they're marked in the interest of exploring the extent of our survivability i'm going to assume that you know i'm giving that ac bump to ourselves but of course you might again depending on how your dm is playing it you might want to give that to a more vulnerable ally one note you you might not necessarily want compelled duel, which may surprise some of you. Uh, it, it's it's an it's a pretty good spell. It it, it works similarly similarly to your mark in that um, you cast it and it gives one enemy within thirty feet disadvantage if they attack anyone else. But it requires your concentration. They get to make a wisdom save to resist it, and it can be broken by you casting a harmful spell against another creature, or if one of your allies harms the 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 creature that you have compelled dual cast on. It's pretty restrictive. We already have a very efficient and effective way of getting most of the same benefits from that spell with just our weapon attacks. But you might want to sort of, uh, you know, keep it uh, ready for a ranged soft taunt, right? As your mark only works on enemies within five feet of you, as we have mentioned. Okay, time for our first damage report at level six. So I'm going to assume that you've got plate plate armor at this point with shield of faith up. We have a 23 armor class, right? We've got 18 for the plate, plus two for shield, plus one for the defense fighting style, plus two for shield of faith. And 58 hit points, that's very tanky, especially at level six. Now, when we cast the shield spell, it's gonna give us a 28 armor class for, for that one round. But of course, we can only cast that once per day as a mark of sentinel human and it almost made me want to take a one level multi-class dip into like a sorcerer who could get access to the shield spell regularly or even like a hexblade warlock when i crunch the numbers i'm going to assume that we've got the shield spell up and therefore a 28 armor class i fully realize that you can only do that once per day and so that's not going to be you know what you're going to have access to every single turn. But again, that's just sort of exploring the limit of what's possible. If you want to have that available to you more reliably and more consistently in game, consider taking you know, a level one dip into Sorcerer or Hexblade here. And then of course you'd get some other benefits by doing so. But for those who don't know how I do my damage reports for tank builds, it's fairly simple. It's, it's overly simple, right? And it's not really meant to simulate actual combat in D&D. We basically put, pit ourselves against a, a boss fight, a sort of average typical fight, and then a never-ending fireball spell just to see how we do against those with our armor class at the highest we can get it and assuming our hit points. And then I calculate, you know, damage taken per round at that armor class or spell save when it comes to the fireball. And then, um, you know, based on our hit points at that rate of damage, how long would we survive, um, you know, rounds to die. And so this is just the standard that I've created to compare my tank builds to one another. So at level six, the boss fight that we have is a young white dragon and they would do on average to us four, you know, so it'd be four damage taken per round. And at that rate, uh, we would survive for 15 rounds, so it would be 15 rounds to die. The typical fight that we've arbitrarily constructed uh, was against four berserkers, and our damage taken per round is three, and rounds to die is 20 at that rate. And then against a never-ending, you know, level three DC 14 fireball that just hits us every single turn, um, we would take 22 damage uh, per round and we would survive for three whole rounds at that rate. So, okay, we've got an obvious weakness here and that's spells and especially, you know, dex save based spells. Um, we're gonna wanna shore that up. 
Of course, it's very unlikely that you're going to get hit in the face with a fireball for three rounds in a row, but it, I suppose it could happen. Against direct attacks, against our armor class, right? We are as good as pretty much every other tank build that I've done and, and better than, than, than a lot of them for that matter. So I feel pretty good about our survivability here and about our ability to also protect our allies. Okay, at level seven, we are a Paladin three and we get first up Divine Health, a Divine Health feature which um, makes us immune to disease, which is fantastic. And then we get our Sacred Oath, our Paladin subclass, and we are going with the Oath of the Ancients Paladin. Here's what we read about the Oath of the Ancients. The Oath of the Ancients is as old as the race of elves and the rituals of the druids. Sometimes called Fey Knights, Green Knights, or Horned Knights, paladins who swear this oath cast their lot with the side of the light in the cosmic struggle against darkness because they love the beautiful and life-giving things of the world. They adorn their armor and clothing with images of growing things, leaves, antlers, or flowers to reflect their commitment to preserving life and light in the world. Okay, so I think we probably want to spend some time here thinking about why your character story would take them in this direction for this oath. To me, what makes the most sense is that, you know, perhaps we've developed a bond uh, with our mount that, that, like, has caused us to feel sort of more reverence, I think, towards nature, even more than most paladins would. Uh, you know, maybe you don't appreciate the way that you see other mounted combatants, other cavaliers, treat their four-legged partners in, in battle, treating them uh, like servants, as opposed to the noble and intelligent companions that they are. Uh, and that has maybe led you to align yourself more with nature, to champion her cause. Whatever the reason, this oath is really, really great for us and for our allies, eventually helping us even shore up the weakness that I mentioned a minute ago. All paladins get two channel divinity options when they take their oath, uh, and we can use them once per short rest. First up, we have Nature's Wrath, which lets us potentially restrain a creature with like spectral vines, barring a strength or deck save they get to choose. Unfortunately, our DC is based on our charisma and isn't fantastic, so we're not going to get that to succeed a ton, I don't think. It is a nice way to hold an enemy in place and thus protect your allies if you can get the enemy to fail their saving throw. You also have Turn the Faithless, which lets you turn Fey or Fiends as an action. Any Fey or Fiend within 30 feet that can hear you has to make a Wisdom save, and if they fail, they have to run away from you for one minute uh, or until they take damage. That's nice. Don't forget, however, that if we're using Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we do have access to Harness Divine Power here, which is an optional Tasha's feature. That basically lets you ch trade your Channel Divinity to regain um, an expended spell slot. So as a bonus action, once per day for now, and the spell slot can be no more than half of your proficiency bonus rounded up. Uh, that's a second level spell slot for us for now, which we don't even have access to yet. So anyway, to be honest with you, I think that I would probably be using Harness Divine Power more than I would actually be using my Channel Divinity here to just regain uh, expended spell slots, uh, especially because our Charisma score isn't amazing and so that DC is fairly low. Okay, at level 8 we are a Paladin 4 and we get another Ability Score Increase or Feat, and to be honest with you I'm a little torn on what to take for the Ability Score Increases or Feats. Frankly from here on. But, you know, for us right now, on the one hand, we could take the Shieldmaster feat here, which on paper seems nice, right? Shieldmaster gives us some, some pretty decent benefits. First, if you take the attack action, you can use a bonus action to shove a target five feet. That's kind of nice, but you also don't really want to move your target away from you generally uh, if they're marked or you'll lose you know, that, that benefit. Also though, the, the Shieldmaster feat allows us to add our shield's armor class bonus to our dexterity save, but only if the spell or effect that we're saving against targets only us. I hate that so bad. Why, wizards? Why? I mean, outside of the Disintegrate spell, I can't even think of when this would benefit us. And I'm sure that you all will let me know some other things that, you know, where, where 
you need a deck save, but just you, and it's not an area of effect. I, I didn't want to take the time to look it up. Regardless, you know, it makes me mad. If it just let us always add our shield bonus to our dexterity saves, period, I would take this feat for sure. Anyway, it also tells us that if we make a deck save against an area effect, like a fireball, then if we make the save, we take zero damage. The problem is, we only have a plus one to our dexterity saving throw right now. So while this would certainly help, we're very often going to be failing that saving throw anyway, frankly, and not then getting any benefit from this feat. You know, if it would kind of work like evasion and let us take half damage if we failed or something, the shield's still helping us a little bit, then absolutely it would be great. But, but as it is, I just, I don't know. I think I would rather take tough here, uh, which raises our hit points by two per level. Uh, you know, bumping constitution is obviously a, you know, a potential good choice as well. It would only give us one hit point per level, of course, instead of two, but it also increases our constitution saving throw and other things. We are proficient in constitution saving throws, so I think, I, I think tough is a little more valuable for us here. And again, of course, you might want to bump strength instead to hit more often and hit a little bit harder. So just do that if you prefer. Lots of good options little bit difficult to make a decision, frankly. All right, at level nine, we are a paladin level five, and we finally get extra attack. Again, you might have gone fighter five before taking paladin levels, and if so, this is redundant, but uh, if not, you will be really happy to finally get this. We also get second level spells. There's some really good ones here. I think you should probably take lesser restoration. Um, if no one else in your party has it, so that you can cure blind, deaf, paralyzed, or poison. I'm also going to assume going forward that you're using the aid spell on yourself and your allies, at least two of your allies. It lets you give five extra hit points to up to three characters, and it's not temporary hit points. It raises your maximum hit points, right, by five, and gives you fills up those five that you that, that your max was just raised by it lasts for eight hours it doesn't require concentration it scales quite nicely adding five more for each level that you upcast it the eight hour thing can be a little bit tricky as you know oftentimes it won't last quite an entire adventuring day i really wish since i'm getting mad at wizards of the coast today apparently eight hours is such a clunky duration right um i wish they would have made it it seems like the intent is to have it last for an entire adventuring day but in reality you know you're gonna want 16 hours to really get you through an entire adventuring day i think but whatever. You might not want to burn the spell slot, or it might not still be on when you're fighting, you know, nine hours into your adventuring day or whatever, but I'm going to assume that you do and that it is. Uh, your companions will be better protected this way as well, at least two of them, so that's fantastic. Speaking of great defensive spells that don't require concentration, thanks to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, keep in mind that all paladins now get access to uh, the Warding Bond spell instead of just like Oath of the Crown. And it's worth mentioning, uh, it lasts for just an hour and it bonds you with an ally so that they gain plus one to their armor class and until the spell ends, anytime they take damage, they have resistance to the damage, but then you take the same amount of damage. So they take half of that damage basically and you take the other half. You're basically just sharing the damage between you, right? This is a fantastic way to help an ally stay alive longer and it's a terrible way to improve your own survivability. <laughs> um, but again, as a tank, if you're just hard to kill, you're not really, and not providing any other benefit to your party, you're not being a very good tank. So uh, this can be a great way to help your party survive longer if they're super vulnerable and if a lot of other allies are being targeted by your DM, regardless of your marks that you're throwing down, right? But as for the other spell that I think you really have to take here, and it's one of the main reasons, frankly, why I wanted to go Paladin, uh, it's Find Steed, of course. This is This spell is only available to Paladins, and it just feels like without it, you are not being the best mounted combatant that you can be. First, um, I have to get into the mounted combat rules a little bit for this. The thing is that the rules tell us that when we are on a mount, we can either control it, thus uh, having it move on our turn and take advantage of its probably increased move speed, right? Or um, we can let it act independently. 
meaning that it might fight with us and make attacks if it's capable of doing so, but but that happens on its turn and it rolls its own initiative, right? And so it, it might just move where it wants to move and not where you want it. And it might not be, you know, five feet within your marked enemy uh, on your turn. It might move away or go somewhere else or something like that. So you might lose the benefit of marking them, etc. So I think that I have to assume that up until this point, most of us were simply using our mounts as controlled mounts and thus benefiting from the additional move speed. With the Find Steed spell, however, I think the vast majority of DMs would let you have your cake and eat it too uh, for mounted combat. That is, I think they would let you direct where your mount uh, takes you and have it make attacks against the target that you want it to make. Um, it might not necessarily move on your turn if you're letting it act independently. Rules as written, uh, an independent mount acts on its own turn and initiative order, but I think for most of us, this is the way to be most efficient in mounted combat. If your DM is willing to let you use your mount both as a controlled and independent uh, mount simultaneously, then this spell becomes, I think, vastly less important. For the rest of us, it's amazing. Again, please check the, the DMs episode on mounted combat uh, for further clarification and debate if you want. I linked to it earlier. Anyway, with this spell, we get to summon a warhorse, or elk, or pony, or camel, or mastiff, or your DM might allow something else, I suppose, that is unusually intelligent, strong, and loyal. We are told that we have an instinctive bond with the steed that allows you to fight as a seamless unit. You can make any spell that you cast that targets just you to also target them. So Shield of Faith would bump their armor class uh, as well, for example, though likely you've taken the mounted combat feat and so you could force any attack against them to target you instead, which you should probably do because you're going to have a much higher armor class than your mount will. But maybe if you're close to death or something, I don't know, let, let them get targeted and the higher AC would benefit. They remain with you until you dismiss them as an action. So you cast it once and it can last for days and days and days, right? Doesn't require your concentration. If they drop to zero hit points, of course they will disappear, but you can resummon them then with a, with a spell slot later. You can communicate with it telepathically while they are within a mile of you. And so assuming that you're using a war horse, you're now adding 2d6 plus four damage per turn, plus six to hit. Uh, with a nice trampling charge move that lets you potentially knock an enemy prone and then grant your horse another attack. I just, I love this spell. I can't imagine playing this archetype without it. And it gives us so much benefit, really, both in damage and sort of, um, I don't know, ability to really play this kind of mounted combatant uh, to the, the ultimate level, I think. Um, okay. Time for a damage report at level 9. Uh, our armor class has not increased since last time, and, and it really won't through the rest of our life unless we get, you know, magic armor and magic shields, which I'm sure we will, right? Um, but our hit points have increased uh, significantly thanks to the aid spell, thanks to the tough feat, and more levels. We've almost doubled, so we're at 108 hit points currently. Um, so against our boss fight here was a uh, was a young blue dragon this time and we would take six damage per round and at that rate we would survive for 18 rounds It'd be 18 rounds to, to die our typical fight was against four hobgoblin captains um, and the DTPR is the same, six, and rounds to die, of course, the same as well, 18. And then against a never-ending level five, um, 15 DC fireball, we would take 29 damage per round and survive for four rounds at, at that rate. Shieldmaster would have helped us a little bit here, but hang tight, very shortly, we're going to get two things that are going to really help us against spells. So. At level 10, we're a Paladin 6, and we get Aura of Protection. This is just one of the best defensive party buffs in the game, in my opinion. And I so rarely get this deep into Paladin to get it, which makes me sad. Whenever you or an ally within 10 feet have to make a saving throw, you or your ally get to add a bonus to that save equal to your Charisma modifier. Anytime no limit on how often we benefit, um, you just have to be conscious, right? 
everyone is just going to want to be close to you from now on. Um, they're going to want to just cuddle up and get all snuggly with their paladin friend. Now, unfortunately, our charisma bonus is only plus two at the moment. So this feature is not as amazing as it could be. But a free plus two to all saving throws is still pretty fantastic. So at level 11, we are a paladin seven and we get the aura of warding. So now we have two auras. Uh, one to increase everyone's saving throw, that's near us anyway, and now this that says, you and your allies within 10 feet all have resistance to all spell damage. That is amazing. It's so good that I, that I kind of have a hard time imagining playing any other paladin if you're going seven levels in, and I know I've done it. This is the first time I've done an Oath of the Ancients Paladin before, but uh, in my defense, um, I'm not as smart as I sometimes think I am. It's just, <laughs> it's really good. No, it doesn't do a lot for us for damage, of course. So for damage builds, you know, I, I've used other oaths, but man, for defense, this is so fantastic. Resistance to all spell damage, period. Woo. So with those two amazing auras under our belt, and our steed found, I think we have a bit of a crossroads here for our character. On the one hand, we could go back to fighter, cavalier. Um, they get some really nice features and abilities, including another great use of our reaction that would be even stronger than interception for reducing damage to our allies, uh, warding maneuver. We'd get indomitable, which essentially lets us reroll a failed save once per day, um, further bolstering our strength against spells and things. And we'd get the hold the line feature, which lets us have an easier time getting opportunity attacks against our enemies and reduces an enemy speed to zero if we successfully hit with an opportunity attack like the sentinel uh, feet, right? That's really great. Not to mention, of course, that third attack at uh, fighter level 11. Here's the thing. <sighs> Both hold the line and warding maneuver, while great, essentially depend upon our reaction, right? And we have a lot of demands on our reaction right now. Frankly, while interception might not be quite as good as warding maneuver, you can only use warding maneuver constitution modifier times per day, which is only a three for us right now, four later, five later, I guess. As for that third attack, which is fabulous, it wouldn't come until character level 18, and a lot of us aren't even gonna be playing the game at that point, right? What's more, there are some really fantastic paladin features that we can still pick up to let us further protect and defend our allies, and ultimately, if we stick with paladin, we get what I think is like the pinnacle of accessible mounts in all of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, easily accessible mounts, I should say, easily. So if you really want to go back to Cavalier, you absolutely should. I think you'll be a fantastic tank. I don't think you'll regret it. As for us, we're gonna stick with the Oath of the Ancients Paladin. And so at level 12, we would be a Paladin 8. We get another ability score increase or feat. I think you can make really solid arguments for bumping your constitution, your strength, or even your charisma now here. As um, you know, as with most, most paladins, we're really mad, you know, multi multiple ability score dependent. Really tempted me to go Hexblade 1 so that I could at least double up on strength and charisma, right? But strength would obviously help you do uh, more damage and land your like soft taunt more regularly. Charisma would Im really improve your aura of protection right now, among other things, and honestly might actually provide more benefit to your party than just about anything. But since we're building for survivability, and of course I'm interested in exploring, you know, the extent of our survivability here, I'm probably going to take a bump to our constitution, raising it to 18, so that we can increase both our hit points and our constitution saving throws. At level 13, we're a paladin 9, and we get third level spells. So there's lots of great ones for support and and things. Um, Aura of Vitality that lets you be a pretty good healer at the cost of your concentration. Crusader's Mantle, if you want to bolster your party's offensive capabilities, it lets you know every member uh, of your party essentially add a D4 in damage to their attacks, also requires concentration. You could get Remove Curse, you could get Revivify if uh, if no one else in your party can, can resurrect. That's definitely a, something you're gonna wanna have. I think you need to just kind of pick your favorites here, but very importantly, keep in mind that as a mark of sentinel human, you get access to counterspell. And it's actually one of the main reasons why I wanted to go mark the sentinel, because 
Counterspell is amazing and lets you as a reaction, you know, potentially shut down uh, an enemy spellcaster um, when they when they cast a spell. It's it's one more argument for raising your charisma actually because uh, you know if they cast a spell at a higher level than you're casting counter spell, you got to make a check and it's going to be based on your charisma. Uh, you know you're, you're bumping your charisma will help you succeed on that check more often. But anyway, that's a great way to sort of bolster our anti magic uh, defense capabilities here. Do keep in mind as well that we could upcast aid here as a third level spell, raising our maximum hit points by 10 uh, for us and two of our allies. And I'm gonna assume for the damage report that we are doing that. So for the damage report at level 13, uh, our armor class still the same, but we've gone up to 170 hit points, assuming that we're using aid as a third level spell. We also gained a nice plus two uh, to our saving throws and resistance to magic damage. So the boss fight here is an adult white dragon and the DTPR damage taken per round would be 11, and it would take us at that rate 16 rounds to die. The typical kind of normal average fight would be against uh, five Helmed Horrors, and we would take eight damage per round against five Helm Horrors if they were all just attacking us with both of their attacks every single turn, and we would survive for 22 rounds at that rate. And then um, against a never-ending level 7 DC 16 fireball, we would take 17 damage per round and survive for 10 rounds at that rate, which is much, much better uh, for spell defenses, so that makes me feel pretty good. At level 14, we're a paladin 10, and we get Aura of Courage, yet another Aura. So now, you and your allies within 10 feet can't be frightened. One of the main reasons why I wanted to continue down the paladin path, to be honest. So now, to be clear, you and your allies within 10 feet have a bonus to all of your saving throws, resistance to all spell damage, and can't be feared. In addition, any target you hit has disadvantage when they attack anyone but you, as long as they're within five feet, and as a reaction, you can reduce a not insignificant amount of damage done to a nearby ally. If the enemy decides to try and hit them anyway, and actually succeeds, um, oh, and if they do, you'll get an extra attack against them that does extra damage. It feels really good. You, you've got some fantastic ways to really bolster and protect your allies, and they love you. At level 15, you're a Paladin 11, and we get improved Divine Smite. Speaking of a little extra damage, we now get an extra 1d8 of radiant damage with each melee weapon attack. And there's no reason why you can't stack this with like regular Divine Smite for a pretty powerful smackdown when you, when you really need it. At level 16, we are a Paladin 12. We get another ability score increase or feat. You know, I've got the same conundrum as I've had this entire time. What to take? I'm again, I'll probably just in the in the interest of exploring the possible from a survivability standpoint, I'm gonna bump our constitution, finally capping it at 20. But if you'd rather bump strength or charisma, I think you would be very well justified for doing so. At level 17, finally, we are a paladin 13. We get fourth level spells. And there are a lot of really good ones to choose from, as always. Death Ward is yet another fantastic eight-hour duration non-concentration buff that lets you protect um, yourself or an ally so that the first time that you or they would drop to zero hit points, they just drop to one hit point instead. Can be a real lifesaver. Um, that was terrible. I'm sorry. It was too easy. Um, <laughs> anyway, it can even counter things like power word death, uh, which is super fantastic. I also wanted to mention stone skin. Um, this is something that most paladins don't get access to, but Oath of the Ancients Pallies do, and it's really pretty powerful. So it requires concentration, it only lasts for an hour, and it consumes diamond dust worth 100 gold as the material component. So it's not cheap, of course, we're level 17, so that shouldn't be too painful for us at this level, I don't think. But anyway, it grants you, or an ally, I suppose, uh, resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, and that's really quite powerful. Again, you know, keep in mind, I've mentioned this many times on this channel, but most enemies in D&D, right, that deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, don't actually do magical bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. It's just regular bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage. And, you know, even though many of them might be resistant to non-magical 
bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. They don't actually deal it themselves most of the time, more often than not. So when I crunch numbers for our final damage report here in a moment, for the boss fight, the adult red dragon, which has a plus 14 to hit, uh, we're actually better off with stone skin on ourselves than plus two to our armor class. Yes, we will get hit a bit more often overall, but, but on average, the damage that we take goes down significantly as a result. The typical fight, though, against five helmed horrors, they only have a plus eight to hit, and in that case, we're actually better off with the higher armor class still, because they would only hit us if they crit, assuming we have access to the shield spell. So there's some interesting math going on here where we will sometimes be better with one, uh, sometimes better with the other, and that's fine because we only have one fourth level spell slot anyway, right? and the spell only lasts an hour, so generally you're gonna to wanna to save stone skin for that fight against something that has a really high plus to hit. And you know, you're not gonna have it every single fight, of course, uh, which is okay, because we don't need it every single fight necessarily. As for the final fourth level spell that I wanted to talk about, it is, of course, find greater steed. The only thing better than a glorious cavalry charge on a powerful warhorse is dive bombing your enemies from the sky on a freaking griffin. Um, so for all intents and purposes, this spell functions identically to the fine steed spell, except that instead of a warhorse or an elk or a mastiff, it lets you summon a griffin or a pegasus or even a periton or a rhinoceros, which I actually used in my Pokemon trainer build and I don't have any cards left to link to it, but anyway, you can find it pretty easily if that sounds interesting and you haven't seen it. Or a dire wolf to fulfill your like Lord of the Rings, orc, warg fantasies, or even a saber tooth tiger to fulfill your greatest Tyrande Whisperwind, you know, night elf World of Warcraft fantasies. The reality is, you don't actually get a lot of additional tankiness or protection from this spell, but the extra damage and just sheer flat out awesomeness of it is so amazing. I, I can't imagine creating, creating a character who is specifically designed for mounted combat and passing on the opportunity to have a freaking flying mount, if I can get it, right? So anyway, you definitely wanna get this spell if you can. For our final damage report then, against the boss, our armor class actually goes down by two, like I mentioned, since we're not using Shield of Faith, but again, we'll have resistance to all the damage that they do to us, thanks to Stone Skin, and the only other difference you know, between our last damage report and now is that our hit points have gone up fairly significantly due to, uh, all the way up to 235 due to uh, a 20 constitution, more levels of course, and now we can cast aid as a third level spell. We could actually cast it as a fourth level spell, but we only have one of those. I'm going to assume that we'll use it for like stone skin or death ward or something else. So anyway, I'm just assuming eight as a third level spell here, which is still, you know, 15 extra hit points. Against the boss fight here, that's an adult red dragon. Uh, we would have a 13 damage taken per round. And at that rate, uh, it would take us 18 rounds to die. The typical fight was against five earth elementals, and if they were all attacking us with all of their attacks, uh, we would on average take 12 damage per round and survive for 19 rounds at that rate. And then against a meteor swarm, no more fireballs. This is a ninth level spell. Um, meteor swarm would be 58 damage taken per round, and we would survive for four rounds at that rate. Just in case you're curious, had we taken Shieldmaster at some point, instead of, say, buffing our constitution, right, it only would have reduced the damage of Meteor Swarm from 58 to 46 uh, damage taken per round. It's, it's not nothing, but I just feel like without a decent deck score to begin with, or maybe a higher charisma score, right, to bump our saving throws, Shieldmaster is just not all that amazing for us. All right, final thoughts. Um, man, I have a lot of fun with these tank builds. I really do. It's one of my favorite archetypes to play in game. You know, and at the end of the day, this build compares really quite nicely to to other tank builds that I've done. Yes, it is a little bit weaker at early levels against magic damage, I think, early on. But by the time you get to Paladin 7 especially, you're really better than any of them except the rogue tank. And the rogue tank really only is better than us against dexterity-based saving throw spells, right? 
we are resistant to all magic damage. And again, not just elemental damage like most of the other tank builds that I've done. You know, they all had absorb elements and that's how they were getting resistance to a lot of that spell damage other than the bear totem barbarian. We're resistant to all magic damage. So that's fantastic. And oh, did I mention that our allies also get those benefits if they're within 10 feet of us, right? Honestly, for this reason and a couple of others, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I feel like this tank might be the best at protecting their allies, better than any other tank build that I've done, which um, makes me really, really love it and want to play it. Another thing to keep in mind, again, like I said at the beginning, there's really nothing about this build that requires you to be mounted. I mean, you'd scrap the mounted combatant feet and instead maybe picking up, you know, more strength or charisma. And while no, you wouldn't have advantage on your attacks from horseback against medium or smaller creatures, you really wouldn't suffer a lot otherwise. Finally, for those who care a lot about being mounted, and specifically about getting to find greater steed as soon as possible so that you can get that awesome griffin, right? I suppose there is an alternative build here where you could go lore bard instead of paladin. Um, because then, you know, they get magical secrets at six, letting you take fine steed. And, uh, and then again, magical secrets at 10, bard 10, which would let you take find greater steed. It's a huge investment. It really only lets us get to that griffin, you know, three levels sooner. And while bards definitely bring a lot of potential support options and fun, they just don't provide quite as much beefiness or protection to our allies as the Oath of the Ancients Paladin does. So if your greatest desire is to ride a griffin into battle as quickly as possible, right, then go ahead and take bard levels. Otherwise, I think we're better off with the paladin level. So anyway, that's the episode for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. You're so fantastic. Um, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate your support. And so please, you know, like and comment and subscribe and all those things if you haven't already done that. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. And we will talk to you soon. Take care.